Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome on this chilly Melbourne night. My name is Chris Mead. I'm literary director of Melbourne Theatre Company. Now, I'm sure you, like many of us, have a friend or a colleague who's a journalist, a friend or a colleague who is maybe a novelist, a friend or a colleague who's maybe an essayist, maybe you even know a playwright. But it'd be very, very unlikely if all of those people were, in fact, one person and not just an astonishing essayist, novelist, playwright, but such an accomplished one. Michael Frayn is, of course, the winner of not just one Evening Standard Award, but six. An Olivier Award, the Whitbread Award, a Golden Pen Award, a Tony Award, a New York Drama Critics Award, an International Emmy. Noises Off ran for more than five years on the West End and over 550 performances on Broadway. It's my very, very great pleasure to be in conversation with uh, Michael Frayn, but to invite him to speak for about 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation for about 20 minutes, and then it's over to you. But, Michael, welcome. Good evening. I always feel a little apprehensive about doing events in Australia. Since the first time I came, which was about 40 years ago, and I did an event at the university in Hobart. And we were doing it in um, one of those science demonstration rooms, <laughs> huge windows. And as I started to speak, so the sky outside went black and all the lights came on in the room. And as I continued to speak, a colossal electrical storm broke out. Thunder, lightning flashing, uh, rain drumming on the roof of this, uh, of, this, of this room. And it became extremely difficult to make myself heard. I was sitting behind one of those uh, big um, science demonstration desks. Uh, so I thought the best thing I could do was to go around the front of it and perch on it as insouciantly as I could and lean in the direction of the audience, first this way and that way, trying to make myself audible. Well, then it got worse because the storm began to affect the lighting in the room. And the lights would go off and then it'd come on again, then a spotlight would come on here and the projector would start over here and it was absolutely bewildering. And at the end, uh, my host, the professor who was looking after me, said, I'm, I'm sorry about the storm, it must have made life rather difficult. And I said, well, yeah, it did, but it, what, what was the real killer is when the storm began to affect the lights in the hall. And he said, oh, that wasn't the storm. That was because you were sitting on the switches. <laughs> <laughs> so in the hope the weather doesn't get any worse this evening, I thought I'd speak for uh, 10, 15 minutes or whatever, and say a few things about getting started. And then I would uh, submit to cross-examination by prosecuting counsel here, who will destroy my alibi and make me look a complete idiot. Um, I've been thinking, of, uh, been thinking a lot about getting started because one of my publishers noted recently, uh, what I hadn't noticed, that is that it's exactly 50 years since I published my first novel, The Tin Man. And uh, an American publisher and my uh, British publisher, Faber, are going to reissue the first five novels that I wrote, and I've been writing introductions to them. Uh, talking about how I came to write them, what it was like, what the world was like then, how I got involved in all this. So how did I start uh, writing novels? Well, of course, it began much more than 50 years ago. I wrote lots of stuff uh, when I was uh, a school child. I wrote a lot more stuff when I was a student. There were sketches, lots of stories, uh, even a, a short novel I wrote when I was at school. Uh, but my first uh, real professional work was as a journalist. I, when I left university, I started working for the uh, Manchester Guardian, as it was then called, in the newsroom in Manchester. And uh, being a reporter is actually quite a good um, introductory lesson to writing anything, particularly novels, because you have to uh, write simply if you're a reporter, and you have to get the interest of your readers from the, the first paragraph. But there was a particular reason why the Manchester Guardian newsroom was a great uh, nursery for potential novelists. Because we had a very distinguished predecessor there called Howard Spring. Howard Spring had been a reporter on The Guardian and then become a hugely best-selling successful novelist. 
Um, he hit it with a novel called Fame is the Spur. Well, I think as such is uh, literary fame. Uh, you probably haven't heard of Howard Spring or Fame is the Spur. But it was very famous at the time, and he made a lot of money out of it. And he also wrote a memoir, and all of us in the newsroom uh, read the memoir um, surreptitiously, trying to think how we would follow in Howard Spring's footsteps. And he explained how he came to write uh, Fame is the Spur. He said what came into his head was simply the first sentence of the book. And everything followed from that. And the first sentence was, the woman flamed along the road like a macaw. <laughs> Striking first sentence. And he said, everything flowed from that. Well, it seemed so easy. <laughs> All you had to do was think of some rather striking first sentence, write it down, and everything would follow. So I, while I was a reporter, um, at the weekend, I started writing my first novel. And I have to say, I found it rather harder work than Howard Spring had suggested. Um, I needed more than just a first sentence. I had to think of uh, uh, the outline of the book. It's true that some writers, um, Muriel Spark, for instance, claimed uh, to start a book with even less than the first sentence. She claimed just to start with the title. And then, having got the title, she'd just sit, sit down and the book would follow. But I had to do quite a lot of work to write my novel. Um, and I'd like to tell you that the hard work paid off. And uh, I wrote a bestseller. Well, uh, I sent it to my newly acquired literary agent. And uh, she sent it back saying, I like the first 30 pages. But the next 300 are appalling. <laughs> Well, it seemed a rather, uh, rather depressing uh, balance between good and bad. And she said, if I were you, uh, if, if you like, I will send this round to publishers. But uh, uh, my advice is to put it in the drawer and uh, forget about it. So I did. Um, and I then started writing um, a column for The Guardian. And it was supposed to be a, a reported column. I was supposed to go and interview uh, visiting film directors, that kind of thing, uh, writers uh, who happened to be in Manchester or whatever. Um, and the trouble was I couldn't get round to doing enough uh, interviews and whatnot to write three columns a week. So gradually, I began to write little fictitious pieces, little funny pieces. <laughs> and invent my own characters uh, to live these little stories out. And gradually, uh, the nonfiction um, shrank, and the fiction took over the whole column. Well, that was um, a way of getting your feet wet um, in, in fiction, with these simple two-dimensional characters. Um, and then finally, um, I was writing three columns a week. I just didn't have enough energy left over to write uh, a novel. But I moved to another paper, The Observer, and wrote one column a week, and then uh, started to write my first published novel, The Tin Man. Um, and I did it, got into it very slowly and gently by using the kind of techniques I'd used when I was writing the column. That's to say, two-dimensional characters with very simple jokes. But I discovered um, a good thing about writing fiction. When my wife, uh, Claire Tomlin, was uh, talking earlier, she was saying she couldn't write fiction. She thought it was too difficult. Well, there are difficulties in writing fiction, uh, but they're not nearly as acute as what she does, uh, writing a biography. Because if you write biography, you have to do a lot of research, and you have to remember a lot of stuff. And I have a very poor memory. Um, if you write fiction, you just make it up as you go along. And it goes further than that, because when you start to invent fictitious characters, uh, you begin by thinking of plausible things for them to say and do, and a plot for them to operate. But as you begin to write the story, the characters seem to take over. And a lot of writers hate other writers saying things like this, because it sounds sort of sentimental. But that's what it seems like. The characters begin to say things of their own and begin to do things of their own, and they begin to write the book for you. And the only problem is that you've invented this wonderful plot for them to perform, <laughs> and they don't always want to do it. <laughs> and I sometimes think that writing a novel 
um, is a bit like uh, industrial management or bringing up children. If you bring up children, as, as I'm sure a lot of you here know, um, you can't just you, you begin with having simple plans for how they're going to do so well at school and get wonderful jobs and so forth and, and reflect all your values in life. You rapidly discover it's not like that. Uh, they've got ideas of their own. They've got characters of their own. And you have to find some way of dealing with them. You have to uh, either bully with them or, or compromise with them or something, uh, allow them to do this bit of what they want to do in return for doing their homework or whatever it is. And it's much the same with characters. So that was um, my first novel. Um, and it had taken me a long time to get that far. But it took me much longer still to begin writing plays I didn't begin writing plays till I was, I think, uh, 38 when I wrote my first stage show, which is very old for dramatists. As you know, a lot of, most dramatists begin when they're young. By the time they're 38, uh, they're either um, uh, uh, failed and finished or they've become alcoholics or whatever, <laughs> or they've got ruined by success, which is what happens to a lot of dramatists. Um, why did I not get started on writing plays till I was 38? Because I hated the theatre. I detested and despised the theatre. Why did I detest and despise the theatre? Because when I was a student, I had written a review. This was at Cambridge. Uh, there was a club called the Footlights, and we did a review every summer, performed it in Cambridge, and then a, pro a London producer would take it in and do it for a couple of weeks, run the show for a couple of weeks in the West End. Well, we were all very ambitious. And this was an important showcase for us. And the footlights that I wrote in my last year was the first one that didn't go into the West End. Didn't go into the West End for very good reason, because it wasn't funny. It didn't work. And like the, uh, the fox in the fable, uh, who can't reach the grapes. So he said, well, I never wanted the grapes anyway. They're sour. Who wants rotten, sour grapes? I turned against the theater. And it was a long, long time before I got drawn into it. So how did I get drawn into the theater finally? Well, uh, I had a friend uh, who was um, directing a collection of short plays about the state of marriage. And he was going to do it in the West End. And um, he said, would I write a one-act play about the state of marriage? Well, it's very difficult to resist a challenge, and although I despise the whole activity, I did actually sit down and write a one-act play about marriage. It was a very simple-minded piece, extremely simple-minded piece, an embarrassingly simple-minded piece, about a young couple um, who make a nostalgic return visit to their honeymoon hotel in Venice. Only now they have a small child. And the point of the play was about the difference that children make to your life. So I handed the play in, and the following week, the director rang me and said, I'm terribly sorry, but the producer says he can't do this. It's too filthy. <laughs> and I said, too filthy? My play? Uh, and I was particularly surprised because the producer was a man called Alexander Cohen. He was a famous New York producer working on this occasion in London. And his celebrity was uh, doing very difficult plays. He did the first production of The Homecoming on Broadway and to persuade uh, Broadway audiences to look at the homecoming took a bit of courage. And I said, Alex Cohen says my play is too filthy. And the director says, yes, Alex says he could never do a play in which a baby's nappy is changed on stage. <laughs> and I was so irritated, I wrote three more short <laughs> plays and had an evening of my own plays. And that was my first show in the theater. It was called The Two of Us. And once again, um, as with the, the novel that um, I uh, wrote when I was a reporter. I'd like to report to you that my efforts um, paid off and were rewarded. It was not like that. Uh, in those days, there was uh, what was called a gallery clack. A group of friends used to come to the press nights of all the shows in the West End. And they would sit up in the gallery. And they would go out in the interval and have a drink together. And they would decide whether they liked the show or not. And if they didn't like it, they would come back and barrack the actors through Act Two and catcall them and boo at the end. And they went out in the interval in my show and they decided they didn't like it. They came back and they 
Barrett Act Two and catcall the actors and booed them at the end. And then uh, what I thought was carrying this performance a bit far, they booed me personally in the street outside the theatre afterwards. <laughs> well, that was a painful experience. Um, and the best thing that came out of that evening was a first night present that one of the actors in the cast, Richard Bryars, gave me. He gave me uh, a biography of Noel Coward. And I didn't know much about Noel Coward. I just knew he'd had a life of unbroken success, one dazzling success in the West End after the other. And when I read the book, I discovered it wasn't like that at all. He'd had many, many total flops. Uh, one so catastrophic, uh, it was a light comedy called uh, The Marquise, um, that he would got not just booed in the street outside afterwards, he got spat at. <laughs> not because he was advancing some unpopular political or philosophical ideas, the audience just didn't think the play was very funny, and they spat at him. Curiously enough, uh, somehow a version of this uh, story has got into the cuttings and the way that stuff gets into the cuttings and is now attached to me. So whenever I do interviews, people always start off by saying, will you tell us about the time you got spat at in the street? But it wasn't me, it was Noel Coward. <laughs> However, the lesson of that was that, um, particularly in the theater, failure by its very nature, it doesn't last very long, not many people see your flops. And success, by its very nature, does last, and a lot of people see it. So if you can manage to stay on your feet uh, for a reasonable number of years, people tend to forget the flops and remember the successes. And with any luck, uh, what they remember is a successful career. And I have to say, like Noel Card, I have had a great many flops, appalling flops. Uh, but on the whole, uh, people, like uh, uh, in the introduction tonight, uh, people say kind words about the things that have, that have worked. Um, well, there are a lot of differences between the, the theatre, writing for the theatre, and, writing, uh, and uh, writing novels. I'm surprised that more people don't do the two. Um, I have a very distinguished predecessor, of course, who did Chekhov, who was one of the most brilliant uh, short story writers who's ever lived, and one of the most wonderful dramatists. But not many people do it, and it's a, it's a surprise, because uh, the two forms reflect back and forth on each other, and you discover new things about writing uh, novels by writing plays, and new things about writing plays by writing novels. And one of the things you discover uh, is how important the audience is in the theatre. Take some time to take this in. It doesn't matter in a novel that people are out there reading it, they're reading it individually, you don't know what their reaction is, um, and they don't affect each other. You know, they, they can all be having a rotten, miserable time, but they don't put, put, put each other off. Um, but when you get in front of a living audience, it's different. I have a friend called Stanley Price in London who began by writing novels. And one day he was sitting on the, on the underground, he was sitting on the Piccadilly line, and he realized the man opposite him was reading one of his novels. And so he watched him out of the corner of his eye. And after two or three stops, the man suddenly laughed. And that laugh completely corrupted Stanley because he stayed on the train <laughs> waiting for another laugh and he stayed on all the way to Cock Foster's at the end of the line. <laughs> and thereafter, he didn't write any more novels, he wrote plays. But in the theater, the audience is essential. You are a much more important element in what's going on this evening than I am. Uh, if I were struck with another electrical storm broke out here and I was struck by lightning, it wouldn't make much difference. They'd cart my body out and you'd talk among yourselves and, you know. Uh, and have a nice time, probably a nicer time than listening to me. Uh, if you vanished, and I was up here just talking to an empty room, that would be a case of absolute insanity. And it's quite difficult to be an audience. You have to, audiences are, have to be very disciplined. Uh, and it took audiences, uh, theatre audiences, a long time to learn how to do it. And if you look at uh, descriptions of audiences in the theatre in the, in the 16th, 17th, 18th, even in the 19th century in London, they were uh, very undisciplined. They talked among themselves 
uh, all the time, and they ate oranges and whatnot, spat the pips out over the uh, edge. Um, but people don't do that now. They do actually uh, sit and listen. And the importance of an audience uh, was borne out on me very strongly when I was a student at uh, Cambridge. Uh, and I was reading philosophy. It was a very small faculty, and not many people went to the lectures. Um, and my supervisor, the man who gave me individual lessons each week, was giving a course of lectures on the history of philosophy. And uh, when we began the term, he had an audience of about, what, a dozen, say. And he was a very, very boring lecturer. And at the second lecture, there were only six of us. And at the third lecture, there was only one of us, and that was me. Um, well, I wanted to drop out as well, but since he was my supervisor, my personal <laughs> tutor, it was socially rather embarrassing. Um, but after two or three goes of being lectured on my own by this man, I couldn't face it any longer, because you have such a responsibility if you're the entire audience. <laughs> if you blow your nose or look out of the window, the lecturer's lost his entire audience. <laughs> and I couldn't stand the, the nervous strain. So next time it got to be lecture day, if he was giving two lectures a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 o'clock in the morning. Next Thursday at 9 o'clock in the morning, I stayed in bed. 10 past 9. <laughs> knock on the door, and around the door came a familiar face. And he said, I just wondered if you were coming to my lecture this morning. <laughs> well, since I was visibly doing nothing more important, I had to get up and get dressed and follow him to the lecture room. And thereafter, thereafter, for the rest of the term, he collected me onto the way to the lecture room every day. <laughs> and I heard the entire course of lectures on my own. Um, well, fortunately, in the theatre, uh, you don't usually get down to an audience of one. Um, even if the show is not doing very well, uh, it comes off long before uh, you get down to an audience of one. And the community, the communal reaction of the audience is, is terribly important, particularly for comedy, particularly for farce. Very difficult to get a farce going uh, if you don't get that kind of panic-stricken uh, reaction from an audience who infect each other. And there was a famous, notorious case in what was then called Tanganyika back in, I think it was 1962, um, when this uh, phenomenon of, uh, of infectious laughter got out into the community. And uh, three girls in the girls' school started to laugh. Well, many girls in many girls' schools around the world have laughed over the course of history. But for some reason, these three girls laughing gradually set off, first of all, the rest of the class, and then the rest of the school. Um, and the authorities couldn't contain it, because every day they came in and they started laughing. And eventually, the education authority in what was then Tanganyika uh, had to close the school. But by this time, the bug had already escaped to other schools in the district. And in the end, they had to close 14 schools and keep them closed for 18 months. And it was just like cholera or whatever, this, this uh, mass uh, hysteria. Um, so, how do you get started? Well, I'll tell you how I got started in another of my professions as a screenwriter. Uh, this is a, a more edifying story. Uh, when I was uh, writing my column um, in the newspapers, I got a phone call one day from a man called Michael Winner. Well, Michael Winner and I had been uh, students together at Cambridge, and I hadn't seen him since. And uh, he explained that what he was now doing was making films. And he had uh, made what was called the first English color nudie, that's to say a film involving girls with no clothes on. And he had bankrolled it himself, put up the money himself, 20,000 pounds, a uh, very small price for making a film, and grossed £120,000. And this um, result um, meant that he was offered all kinds of stuff in the cinema. Actually, actually multiply your investment by five, 
uh, was something that was unknown in the cinema. And he phoned to say he'd just discovered that um, Gilbert and Sullivan had come out of copyright, and he was going to make the first rock version of uh, The Mikado. And would I like to come and see it? He said, have you ever been in a film studio? I never have been in a film studio. And I said, yeah, I'd, I would actually like to, to uh, uh, come and see it. I have to tell you that Michael Winner eventually became uh, even more successful and became possibly the worst film director there's ever been in the world. But at that stage, it was quite early in his career. So he said, okay, well, come down to Shepparton Film Studios tomorrow and come to soundstage number four and uh, make yourself known and I will show you everything how, how, about how films are made. I'm extremely intrigued. Drove down to Shepparton, found soundstage number four, which was an enormous black corrugated uh, shed as big as an aircraft hangar. And I parked. And I didn't realize I was at the back of the studio instead of the front. And the only door I could find into it was a very small door in one corner. So I cautiously opened the door. And inside this enormous building was blackness. Blackness, blackness, blackness. Except at the very far end of it, I could see some very bright lights. And I could hear uh, a familiar voice, my old friend Michael Winner, uh, insulting the cast and crew. So I knew I was in the right place. So I thought, what's the polite thing to do? The polite thing to do is to uh, creep quietly up to where he's working, wait until he's finished the shot, or whatever it's called in the cinema, and then introduce myself. So I crept quietly through the darkness, and what I didn't realize in my ignorance was the darkness was not empty. The, in the darkness, there were other sets waiting to be filmed on on other days. Uh, what I certainly didn't realize was that in one of these sets, there was an eight-foot deep ornamental pool flush with the floor. <laughs> And one moment I was creeping quietly and politely through the darkness, and the next moment I was underwater. In fact, I didn't even know it was water. It might have been acid, for I might have been in a vat of acid. Uh, so I grabbed the side and hauled myself up. Well, that was, that was bad enough. But what was even worse was that no one had seen me fall in. So the first thing uh, anyone knew about my adventure was the sound of approaching footsteps through the through the darkness, squelch, squelch, squelch. And eventually all work stopped and people turned around to see this creature from the horror deep with literally water running off me from head to foot emerging into the light and saying, hello, it's your own friend from university. Well, that was a very bad start uh, in the cinema from which I never quite recovered and I've never had much success as a screenwriter. <laughs> Story of my life. Well, let, let's set back just a, a little bit. Um, one of the, you know, you're a fantastic storyteller. I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you start a joke? If we're talking about starting things, is it, is it an entirely technical thing? You know how a joke works, and, or is it, is it just a situation that you can see that there's a lot of juice there that will yield a fantastic situation? How do you...? Well, I, I'm not sure I've ever told a joke. Um, <laughs> You mean, how, how do I write uh, comedy? Hmm. Well, I think uh, sometimes you see there's some sort of funny relationship uh, that uh, happens between people in life. And uh, as you think about it, you begin to see the characters, the fictitious characters to whom this might be happening and how their relationship might develop. And each time you think about it, you see a bit more of the story. But then, as I say, when you actually begin to write it, the uh, devils are not uh, as grateful as they should be for your bringing them into life and giving them their existence. They do start to get uh, stroppy, rebellious. One of the great joys of reading work of your work in, in novel form or in, in the plays is that, like any great work of art, it exists on the edge of chaos. And all of your characters seem to be you know, fighting heroically or rather haplessly against these forces of chaos which they can't control. Is this a, do you start from that outside standpoint or is it always much more inside that you're writing? Um, well, I think it's, it's not surprising if things turn out that way because after all, what does the uh, second law of thermodynamics teach us? That entropy is increasing. That's to say that disorder is increasing in the universe. In any closed system, disorder is increasing. And you could construct a view of human life and human activity as a struggle against entropy. 
It's a long struggle to impose some kind of order on things. In fact, in America, my second novel is called Against Entropy. No one liked that title in England, so they call it something else. No one liked the English title in America. So people, uh, end, people endlessly ask me, so this is this novel Against Entropy that, sir, that you wrote. We have, can't find it at the bookshops, anyway. Uh, but you could see uh, all human activity as an effort to stop the world sliding into chaos. I mean, if you just think about uh, the practical realities of life, uh, if, you've got, if you're in a house or a garden or whatever, how much time you spend keeping that house and garden going and stopping the, the mice eating everything, stopping the fungus getting in and destroying uh, the, 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 uh, the fabric of the house. Uh, so I think it's, it's not surprising if uh, there's a lot of uh, struggle with chaos in fiction. You mentioned also earlier that uh, when you you know you were, you looked with some admiration at the writers who could start from a first line, start from a title. One of I was I actually grabbed it on the way here. I love the first title of Copenhagen. It's but why? It's such a great launching pad into into a play entirely about uncertainty. Do you well, spend hours agonising over the first line, or do they come quickly? Well, I, I rewrote the start of Copenhagen many, many times. Uh, but the, the, it's, it, it, it's sharp of you to notice that line, because no does, that is the story of the play. The story of the play, everyone thinks it's about the morality of, of scientists, should you work on weapons or of mass destruction. Mass destruction. Uh, it's not really. It's about how we know why people do what they do. How does one know what one does oneself? Why did, uh, did uh, Heisenberg come to uh, Copenhagen in the middle of the Second World War for what was going plainly going to be a very difficult encounter with his old friend and colleague, Niels Bohr? Uh, difficult because there was now a war on. Uh, Denmark had been occupied by the Germans. Heisenberg was a German. Niels Bohr was uh, a Dane and a half Jew. And uh, much as he loved Heisenberg, it was very embarrassing for him to receive Heisenberg uh, in the circumstances. And Heisenberg plainly wanted to say something. What did he want to say? Many uh, explanation, explanations have been advanced. Uh, so I thought it was reasonable to start the play with my greater saying, actually putting the whole plot of the play into two words. And you often in your work are dealing with complex, rich historical circumstances, but also rich philosophical ideas. Did you adopt comedy as a form or farce as a form to smuggle those ideas through? Or you find in looking at that world of chaos that you inevitably come up with these you know, rich long-standing historical problems we have about imposing order, about heroism, about trying to say something important, but this balance between chaos and, and uh, order, joy, terror. Well, I'm not sure I, I ever actually choose uh, to write comedy or serious things. It's just that um, a lot of things in life have uh, comic. A lot of things in life are terrible and painful and awful, uh, but there are a lot of things which are ridiculous, um, and it's very difficult not to notice those ridiculous aspects and uh, and to want to write about them. Um, why why does the world strike me as more, on the whole, more ridiculous than tragic? I can see perfectly intellectually clearly that it's tragic. Um, well, I wrote a uh, memoir of my father, called My Father's Fortune. My father was a salesman, but he was also profoundly deaf. He went deaf in early middle age and went on functioning as a salesman, as a technical salesman, selling uh, roofing materials to architects and contractors. So they must have had a lot of, uh, of serious uh, questions to be answered. Um, but he tried to avoid um, having to... Uh, respond to people by making jokes as much of the time as possible. Because if you make a joke, uh, people laugh or they don't laugh, uh, but you don't have to hear what they say. And I think, uh, quite unconsciously, I absorbed uh, some of this uh, approach to life from my father. Was it a difficult immersion into the theatre? You, you mentioned being booed at, um, finding it quite horrifying, and that Sounds more like 
to deal with being selected or whatnot, but actually sitting in the audience, having people laugh at your work, that must be a great joy when it happens and horrific when it doesn't. Yes, absolutely, it is. Uh, it's, it is a great joy when it happens, uh, and it's a great privilege to be able to make people laugh. But it doesn't always work, and I've written plays uh, which have not made people laugh, and it is uh, very painful uh, watching them. It's also very curious, uh, if you sit in the, your, in the audience, um, you can't but overhear uh, remarks that the audience make to each other before the show or in the interval at the end. Um, and in all my years of having to watch the previews of plays and seeing many, many different productions of my plays, I've never heard anything good said about any single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> what I recall is that uh, I went in to see Noises Off one night when the original production and uh, I was sitting cowering in the audience, uh, hoping not to be recognized, and there were, were five empty seats in front of me. At the very last moment, in came a party of latecomers, um, and they started opening boxes of chocolates and uh, opening the program and so forth. And just as the lights went down for the curtain to go up for Act One, uh, the woman actually looked at the program and said, Oh no, I thought this was by Alan Aikborn. <laughs> <laughs> Bad way to start an evening. Um, I've never heard anything good said at the end of a play. Michael Codron, who has uh, directed, who has produced most of my plays, done the original productions, has a fund of stories about what he's overheard people saying at the end of plays. At the end of one, he assures me, not a play by me. <coughs> As he came out, there was a very depressed looking couple in front of him. And the man turned to the woman and said, Well, all we need now is to find the dog's been sick in the car. <laughs> I've had, the, I've had the very great privilege of working with some fantastic actors and there is a, there's an extraordinary uh, precision to obviously to what they do about telling a joke, moving away, the joke works better. You know, they have this extraordinary relationship with an audience where they adjust the joke. It's not just a formula. They can actually adjust based on that relationship with an audience. And recently, uh, we, uh, a Melbourne Theatre Company had uh, as a guest the playwright Joe Penhall, who's just won a series of Olivier Awards, has written a whole series of movies. Uh, and you mentioned the 300 appalling pages of your first novel. And he was talking about his play that some of you may know called Blue Orange. And uh, Wonderful he's, play. he's mortified by the fact that the, the script that you can buy in the bookshops um, is the version that went you know, to print, which is before the actual production. And there's a whole series of things they cut when they actually went, you know, after the previews and you've heard, you've listened to that audience. And he talks, about, he's kind of tormented by the four and a half minutes. The play is too long <laughs> by four and a half minutes. Every time he goes and sees a production, they do what's in the book. He's like, don't do the book, cut the four and a half minutes. And it's that relationship to an audience where you're able to sit there and gauge so precisely. And I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit more technically, I suppose, about that relationship and the way you may or may not adjust with someone like Michael Blakemore, your early drafts through to opening night? Uh, most of my um, first productions of, of plays have been done by Michael Blakemore, who I think is one of the greatest directors in the world. And he does the really hard thing for directors to do, which is new plays. If you do uh, standard classics, you know they work. They, people wouldn't be asking you to do them if, if they hadn't worked. Uh, with new plays, the terrifying thing is no, no one has the faintest idea whether they're going to work or not until you get in front of an audience. And when you get in front of an audience, um, you immediately learn a lot of things about the play. Um, you learn that some things which you thought were absolutely crystal clear um, in the script are not, and that the audience can't understand the point. And you really have to change to, to make it clear. You also, almost equally disconcertingly, discover that some things which you thought were just service lines, like you know the carriage awaits or whatever, uh, get a colossal laugh, and you can't understand why. <laughs> All you can do is build on it, or not build on it. Um, but it, I was talking about the importance of, a, of an audience before. There is this extraordinary symbiosis between what's going on on the stage and what's going on in the house. And just as the audience 
uh, in the house is an audience for what's happening on the stage. The uh, actors on stage are an audience for what's going on in the house. And they can't help but notice, quite unconsciously, uh, some nights the audience is not very responsive. And their performance probably goes down a bit. That makes the audience response goes down a bit. And you get uh, into a situation that scientists call negative feedback. On the other hand, it can go the other way. And some uh, particularly responsive audience can actually set the cast doing a slightly better performance because they you can't help but respond. If, if someone is like, likes what you're doing, you can't help but respond to it. And you get into positive feedback. So uh, theater is always an, an unstable medium in that way. Uh, wonderful when it works and terrifying when it doesn't. One of the most contentious things often when working as you're developing a play, and I'm sure it's similar in a novel, is is this idea of what an audience will understand. And I'm fascinated in your plays, they're often, uh, and, and the novels as well, so whether it's theoretical physics in Copenhagen, whether it's the internecine nastiness of politics in East and West Germany, or the, the paintings of Bruegel, you're deeply immersed in research, and of course, everyone will tell you they won't get it, you need to put more in, or please stop with the research, enough already, just tell more jokes. How, how you know, and you also spoke about uh, Claire Tomalin's work, and that she's doing the real work and you're just telling jokes. But so many of your plays are, are so thick with research and yet not heavy with research. How on earth do you find that balance? Well, that's come on fairly uh, late in life, and I think maybe it's because I've uh, looked at Claire doing all this serious research, and I got a bit ashamed <laughs> of the easy ride I've had up to then, and I've started to try and do a, a bit as well. Don't do remotely as much as she does. Uh, but she uh, was saying earlier that um, we've sometimes done some research for her books together. We've walked the, you know, Peeps's walks and Dickens, some of Dickens' walks and so forth together. Uh, we've walked around Hampshire where Jane Austen lived. Uh, and she equally has um, come in on some of my research. We went to Copenhagen together to research it for, uh, for the play. Um, but it's, you also talked about how um, the script gets away from you. And that once there's a printed script out there, um, it's very difficult to get it back and uh, explain to people that, um, uh, uh, that you, you made cuts or made additions or whatever. And um, also, it always says in the contract, uh, no changes are to be made without the uh, authorization of the author. Um, it's impossible to enforce this. And if you go and see a foreign production, you get a lot of surprises. <laughs> Um, I was a period when Noises Off was been playing in Prague um, for a long time. And I had to go to Prague several times. And each time I went, um, I said, uh, could I see the production? And each time they said, it's not playing at the moment. <laughs> so I would come back a few months later and I say, you know, is Noises Off running again now? Can I see it? And they said, no, no, it's out of the repertoire at the moment. Well, finally, after about five trips to Prague, uh, they, uh, they said grudgingly, yeah, okay, all right, all right, if you want to see it, we'll go. Uh, so, big success in Prague, obviously, when they've been still in the repertoire. But what I discovered when I got there, and why they tried to keep me out of the theatre, was they'd taken off the entire last act. <laughs> there were only two acts left. <laughs> and I thought the whole point of the play, what it was leading up to, was this funny last act. But because they didn't have a revolve, and they thought they couldn't get the audience to go up for a second inter in interval, they just cut it off. And I was in Berlin recently, um, uh, launching a book, and um, I knew that they were going to do a production of a play called Democracy that I wrote, which is about Willy Brandt and about German politics. And they were doing it at Deutsches Theater, which is um, the grandest theater in Berlin. So I said uh, I'd like to meet the, the people who were doing it. And um, they, they were in a late stage of rehearsal. I didn't see the rehearsal, so I went with uh, my German assistant done a lot of research on the play with me, and we met the producer and the uh, the director and the dramaturg, and um, they said, "Yeah, oh, you might be interested in that. We've added 43 songs to the play." <laughs> I said, "You've added 43 songs. Doesn't that make for a rather long evening?" And they said, "Oh no, no, we cut a lot of the text." <laughs> And they had indeed uh, cut what seemed to be the central scene in the play when, uh, when 
when um, Willy Brandt and Guillaume, who were spying on him, uh, confront each other in Norway, uh, which seemed to me where, where the, the, what do you call it, the point where the plot comes together. They've taken all that out. Anyway, uh, my German assistant made such an impassioned speech in defense of the play, they put it back again. But uh, German theatre, I very much like Germany and very much like uh, going there. And the one sticking point uh, is German theatre, which is difficult because that's often the reason I go to see productions of my plays. And there is a tradition in Germany that we were talking about earlier called Regie Theater, a theatre dominated by the director. And uh, German directors feel they have to uh, demonstrate that they made their mark on the play by uh, usually destroying the text. <laughs> and uh, I went to see the first German production of Copenhagen. And I was very um, keen this should be good. After all, the play is about a very great German physicist, Heisenberg, who's had a, uh, whose reputation has been in considerable difficulties in Germany. And I was hoping he was going to get a fair ride in the production. Um, and it was being done by a touring company, and I went to see the first performance in a small town just outside Bremen. And it got rather a surprise, because the production was done as a circus performance, <laughs> in which Heisenberg, uh, in the course of the play, did four back somersaults. And Margrethe Bohr, uh, uh, Niels Bohr's wife, was sat in a hole in the stage and provided with a typewriter. And whenever the two men began to go on rather boringly about physics or politics or whatever, she would hammer on the keys, the typewriters, who couldn't hear what they were saying. Um, and that was a, a slight crisis of consciousness about that, because we were supposed to have dinner afterwards with the cast. And in the interval, I went to see my uh, agent who was there. I said, look, I simply can't face them afterwards. Can you find somewhere else to have dinner? And she did, came back, did some telephoning, came back and said, well, it's a small town. There's only one place to have dinner here. Either we have dinner with the cast, or we don't have dinner. <laughs> so we had dinner with them, and I lied. I said, wonderful, wonderful. But then I had breakfast with the director the following morning and told him what I actually thought. We just have, we're running out of time rapidly. We could talk about that a lot. But I just have one more question for Michael, and then we'll throw it open to your questions. So start preparing in your mind. Um, we started the... Well, you set the tone for this by talking about starting out, um, but also about that moment of being booed. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you about failure, I suppose, which is, <laughs> which is fairly common when one is starting out and how on earth one, you know, is it resilience? But I suppose, and it's about the audience as well, and it's about learning from then and learning that joke and learning to become a better storyteller. Oh. There's great joy, of course, in storytelling, but there, there is also an enormous amount to be garnered from listening so carefully to that audience, whether they're laughing or not. Well, um, Noel Coward also said um, somewhere that um, success was the ability to survive failure. Very true of him, and certainly true of me. I've had many uh, flops in life, uh, most notoriously a play called Look, Look, which everyone thought was funny till we got in front of an audience and it wasn't funny. And then my last uh, serious play called Afterlife at the National Theatre didn't catch anyone's fancy. And I have to say I've got a show running in London at the moment which has not caught people's fancy. So I'm a great expert on failure. <laughs> and what can you do? All you can do is um, try and learn something from it. You can sometimes learn from bad reviews. Um, it's very painful reading them. Uh, and often the reviewers haven't actually got their finger on what's wrong with the play, but they can see there's something wrong with it somewhere. And sometimes, sometimes, uh, if you can uh, brace yourself to read the reviews, you can start to think why they switched off, why they got turned off, wherever it was, and sometimes see some way around it. And one of the good things about the theater is that you sometimes get a second chance. More often, of course, with successes, but which are done over and over again. But you, even with successes, you, get a, 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 you often need to do a bit of rewriting. And with Noise It Off, although it was, it was a success, 
I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote every time it was done. Because when it was um, first performed in London, it began as a farce, and then halfway through the last act, it turned into a serious play about uh, what are we all doing in life and with a with a humanity and so forth. And as soon as we saw it in front of a preview preview audience, we realised that the they didn't want to know about with a humanity at that point <laughs> in the evening. Uh, and I had to start rewriting the last act. And um, we had, I can't remember how many shows, uh, this was a theatre in the suburbs of London, um, and we went on, I went on rewriting that last act and getting the cast to learn new versions until one of them was deputed uh, to announce on behalf of the rest of the cast that they were not going to learn any further <laughs> versions of it. But each time we changed a, a cast um, in the West End or when we went to Washington, then when we came from Washington into New York, I rewrote it. And when it was revived at the National Theatre in uh, 2000, I did a, a substantial amount of rewriting. And I gradually got it better because you can learn from people's uh, reactions. Um, but it's, it's very painful with uh, a flop because you don't often get a chance to do it again because it was a flop and people uh, don't want to do it again. But I, it has occasionally happened and I have got the, the, the shows better. I very much enjoyed your, your novel, uh, Sweet Dreams. And some years after reading it, I came across a quotation from, Richard Ser uh, from Robert Serber, who had worked with Oppenheimer in the Los Alamos Project. And he said... I, I, I had a dream, and I dreamt that I went to heaven, and St. Peter led me, into, led me into the presence of God. And God said, you won't remember me, but I took your course in quantum mechanics in Berkeley in 1947. <laughs> 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 and yes. I wondered if you'd come across the quotation. No, uh, Robert Serber was uh, one of the uh, most brilliant physicists yes. at Los Alamos, and he wrote the... Uh, what was called the Los Alamos Primer, which was the book that was given to all people, arrive, physicists arriving at Los Alamos to start on the project for the first time, explaining where they got to uh, with, their, with their research, um, what's everything they discovered so far. Uh, but I hadn't heard about his dream. <laughs> it reminded me of the modest, diffident God <laughs> yeah, in absolutely. Sweet Dreams. Absolutely. And in uh, Sweet Dreams, of course, we're, the, the, uh, the man who's gone to heaven does finally meet God, and he turns out to be um, an extremely nice bloke. <laughs> How did the breakfast with the director go? <laughs> he had a, a hide as thick as, as thick as a rhinoceros is. And he took not the slightest, he smiled and smiled, took not the slightest notice of any of my criticisms. He knew he was doing it right, and I got it wrong, um, and that was that. So it went all over Germany with uh, back somersaults and hammering on the typewriter. Great success everywhere. <laughs> uh, you've talked about how you can rewrite a play sometimes, but in terms of a novel, how do you decide when you've gotten it right? So you said again. How do you know? How do you decide when you've gotten a novel right when it's oh, right. ready? Um, well, you just have to uh, try and get it right in your own head. And then, in my case, I show it to Claire, and she makes some uh, tactful suggestions about rewrites. <laughs> and then, with any luck, you have a good editor at the publishers um, who will also tactfully um, make. Um, intelligent suggestions. And a good editor and a good director in the theatre is very, very important. You really do need someone to react sympathetically but critically to it. And it's a great help to have a, a, a wife who can, who can do that and is prepared to do that. Um, with, with my first novel, written 50 years ago, uh, when I handed that in to my then editor at uh, Collins, Richard Ollard, who was a distinguished writer himself, uh, he said um, very tactfully, um, I liked the last 300 pages, but I didn't like the first 30 pages, which at any rate was a reversal of the proportion. Um, and uh, he persuaded me to take out the first 30 pages and start in the middle of the story. And it was very, very good.
good advice. And uh, I'm sure everyone here is uh, doing courses on writing novels and whatever. And uh, that's a very good piece of advice to get a good editor. Actually, how do people start writing novels these days? Well, these days, I guess, uh, they either go to a creative writing course at university or they go to uh, take one of these commercial courses. Um, in London, The Guardian offer a whole range of courses on um, the biography, but also a whole range of specialist courses on writing novels, how to begin a novel, how to prepare a novel for the publisher. Uh, and the most expensive of all, and they're all expensive, is how to finish your novel. <laughs> 7,000 pounds. Well, I'll give you my complete novel writing course um, for free, in three words. Just do it. And then chapter two is just do it again. And chapter three is then again. And so on. During your uh, Guardian um, column days, um, the evolution from fact to fiction, wa was the paper aware of this uh, progression? Uh, and and if, uh, if not, uh, how long did it take them before they rumbled you? <laughs> well, let me make it clear that uh, I was not uh, trying to deceive anyone. They were plainly sort of funny little bits. I mean, there was a well-established tradition of funny columns with, with funny characters. Uh, it was a great funny columnist called Beachcomber, in the Daily Express for years. I later edited a, a collection of his, his old columns. And there was a famous column in the Daily Telegraph, uh, signed Peter Simple, done by different people at different times. Um, and they were all uh, plainly uh, pieces of, of fiction, little, little um, episodes with, um, with funny characters. And they usually had sort of funny names. Uh, Beachcomber had characters called things like Captain Foul Enough um, and uh, Justice Mr. Justice Cocklecarrot and uh, Dr. Strabismus, uh, whom God preserve, of Utrecht. Well, obviously they were fictitious characters, and I, th I think my characters are pretty obviously fictitious as well. There was, uh, actually, it's how Michael Winner uh, began his career, as, and I've come to mention this, as a film director, because he was a, a columnist on the Evening Standard. He worked for one of those society columns where, where people go around to fashionable parties and say, uh, Lady so-and-so was there making a conversation with uh, uh, the Archduke of et cetera, et cetera, that kind of column. And uh, in order to enliven the column, uh, Michael Winner introduced a fictitious debutante. I think she was called Cynthia Stocking. Do you remember, Claire? Something like that. Um, uh, and she uh, didn't explain she was fictitious. Um, and uh, Cynthia Stocking, whatever it was, the Honorable Cynthia Stocking, turned up and did shocking things, much more interesting things than the real debutants were doing at these, these parties. But eventually he got rumbled. Somebody, uh, somebody sneaked on him. Somebody uh, uh, told the editor what he was up to, and he got the sack. And that's how he got into making films. One. So is that a moral story or is that a moral story? <laughs> We've got one more. Is it someone had their hand up? Grand. Um, so over the course of your career, you've gone from journalism to fiction, you know, novel writing, memoir, screenwriting, playwright, um, you know, and then. So how do you find juggling like the different mediums? Have you ever been tempted just to how do I find with? How do you find like juggling the different forms of writing? Do you um, you know, is there any sort of process from going from one to another? Do you find like there are periods where you must only write plays or...? Um, <coughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you don't really have much choice about it. An idea comes and it seems to be an idea for a novel or an idea for a play. And you can think of, uh, often think of good reasons why some ideas are ideas for plays and some ideas, ideas for novels. Um, but all you can really do is follow the idea. You can't arbitrarily change it into something else. Um, which is, <laughs> it's got some advantages doing different sorts of things. It means that you, you keep starting again from square one um, and you never get into a rut because you're always doing something fresh. But I have to say, 
if you, if you wanted my advice on how to be successful as a writer, having followed my um, elegant advice, just do it, get your career started. If you then want to go on and succeed, my advice would be to write the same thing over and over again, just changing the name slightly, changing the details of the plot, and go on doing it until people have got used to it. And maybe they'll like it. <laughs> and this is not unreasonable. Uh, people want a, a recognizable product. If you go to the supermarket and buy cornflakes, you don't want to get home and find their soap flakes. You, if it says cornflakes on the packet, you want to get home and find their cornflakes. And the most successful writers, I think, are ones who produce a consistent product. And you know when you see their name on the jacket, you know kind of what sort of book it's going to be and whether you're going to enjoy it or not. Another lesson for free. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking the man sitting on the switches, the force of nature, Michael Frayne. <laughs>